Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Dante Fortson here with the second big study on New Year's Day. Dropped y'all two today, same day. God's skin color and other answers about race in the Bible. So we're going to take our time today and we're going to talk about race in the Bible and what role it plays and why it makes people feel uncomfortable and whether or not it's actually mentioned in the Bible. A lot of people say it's not. Um, a lot of people say, well, God doesn't say because he doesn't want us to know. So we're going to talk about that. But first, make sure you subscribe. That's the most important thing right now. Right now, in this moment, click the subscribe button, then click the thumbs up button. And if you have not yet clicked the notification bell, click that button, too, so you can be notified whenever I post new studies. I have a ton of new stuff coming in 2020, so you don't want to miss it. Also, share. That's important too. share. All right. Brought to you by Undeniable. This is full color evidence of black Israelites in the Bible. If you want to look at just the evidence, you don't want a bunch of doctrine or hearsay or any of that. This is the book you want right here. Page after page after page of historical documentation that proves that the Israelites are black. And number two, the black Hebrew awakening, the final 400 years as slaves in America. This book contains all of the history, all of the scripture, all of the evidence of who we are, and it breaks it down from biblical times into the modern day. So if you have not got these two books yet, you definitely want to do that. Paperback is available at Barnes and Noble and on Amazon. And if you have digital, you can get um, you can get these almost anywhere. Um, Black Hebrew Awakening is exclusive to Kindle, but Undeniable is available on Google Play Books, Apple Books, Kobo, Playster, Play um, Kindle. And if you go to the library still, Biblioteca, I believe, um, will supply this book to the library in digital format. This is also brought to you by Ultimate Bible Companions. This is my line of notebooks I created for you guys. Uh, they come lined, they come dotted. So whichever note taking method you want to use, uh, you can pick one. It features charts, weights, times, links, measures, maps that you probably won't get in your study Bible. And these are available on Barnes and Noble and Amazon.com as well. For those of you who want to show your support, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Dante Fortson. If you have the cash app, I can be reached at cash tag B H I T B. I also have PayPal and super chat is enabled for those of you who catch the premiere. So if you want to show your support in the super chat, you can do that too. Finally, before we get started, free book. If anybody wants a free book, it's a PDF copy of pre slavery Christianity. It was never the white man's religion. It's a free book. All you have to do is go to blackhistoryinthebible.com. Again, blackhistoryinthebible.com. Enter your email address. Check your email. Click the confirmation link. That's important. Click the download link to the book and enjoy the book. It's free. Blackhistoryinthebible.com. Find any email subscription box. Enter your email and follow the steps. All right. So let's start with a verse. I kind of like to start with a verse. You all know that for those of you who have been through these studies before call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Jeremiah 33 3. So this is one of those interesting topics that makes people feel a little weird. And so there are a lot of myths around surrounding race in the Bible. Uh, one myth is that talking about race is not of God. Now, the Bible doesn't say that there's no verse in the Bible that says doesn't don't talk about skin color or don't talk about um, ethnicity or culture. It doesn't say any of that in the Bible. And yet people will still make this statement. Another one is the Bible doesn't mention skin color. And again, most people who say this haven't actually looked. They've just heard this from other people. And so they repeat it. And. We're going to talk about all the references the Bible actually does make to skin color. And then third, and as a reason, I put a star next to this one. Salvation isn't about race. Now, here's what's interesting about this. When people say salvation isn't about race, there is a special exception here that only comes up 
when you mention salvation in the context of Christ being black. You don't have to say Christ is only going to save black people um, or anything like that. But the 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 stigma seems to be that if you say Christ is black, one of the first questions non black people have is, well, can I still be saved as if a black Christ suddenly excludes everybody else? And the notion of a white Christ, they automatically assume that it's inclusive of everybody else. And so there's this double standard when it comes to this statement. Salvation isn't about race. And if you don't believe me, test it out for yourself. You can have a movie with white Jesus in it, a picture with white Jesus, a painting with white Jesus. No reaction. But as soon as you say Christ was black. That's when they well, salvation isn't about race. His race doesn't matter. The Bible doesn't mention skin color. Talking about race isn't of God. So those are a bunch of myths that tend to happen when we get into the subject. So why this subject makes people uncomfortable? There are several reasons why this subject makes people uncomfortable. It forces them to deal with the words in the Bible, like the actual words that are there. A lot of people don't know what's in the Bible because a lot of people don't actually read the Bible. They listen to what other people tell them is in the Bible. And so it forces them to deal with the words in the Bible. When they say something isn't there and you show it to them on paper, they have no choice but to accept that it's written right down on paper. It forces them to rethink their belief in God and Christ. As the example I just gave you, when you tell somebody Christ is black, suddenly they have to question whether or not they can have salvation. I'm not sure why that's the first thing they go to, but that's the first thing they tend to go to. Some people don't care, but a lot do. It forces them to reevaluate who they are on the inside, because if they feel a certain way about black people, for instance, and you tell them Christ is black and they come to the realization that Christ is black, then they have to evaluate like, wait, I feel this way about black people, but Christ is black. So that means I feel this way about him, too. And so it causes an uncomfortable shift for them. It forces them to admit that most of what they've been taught to believe is a lie. If you've been fed white Jesus, white Jesus, white Jesus, white Jesus over and over and over again throughout your whole life. Now, it doesn't matter if you're white, black or Spanish or anything. If you've been fed this lie of white Jesus and then you come to a, a complete paradigm shift and now he's not only not white, but he's black, the complete opposite of the spectrum in, in the economic um, status as well. Um, well, actually, Asians are on the top technically, but white people are underneath Asians as far as economics go. But black people are on the bottom. So now all these these myths and stuff about black people, you have to apply to Christ and say, wait a minute. If they've been saying all this stuff about black people and Christ is black. And I know that this doesn't fit Christ or Israel, then what I've been being taught is a lie. I didn't, I didn't want to go that deep into it. I kind of got off into a rant. So <laughs> hopefully you guys forgive me for that. But let's keep moving forward. It forces them to make a choice between their own ideology and what the Bible teaches. A lot of people's ideology is bound in self-hate. And I'm talking about black people that hate the fact that we are Israel. If you tell black some black people that Israel is black and Christ is black, they hate themselves so much that they will not believe it. Not only will they believe that they're nothing more than a slave from Africa, they will get mad at you for believing that you're anything more than a slave for Africa. And then racism. Racism usually comes from people who are not us. And so they will get mad that we dare to believe ourselves to be chosen of God. And so we come into this weird uncomfortableness when we encounter certain people. Now, the reason they get uncomfortable with some of this stuff is because one, they've been fed white Jesus over and over and over and over again, as I mentioned before. But as part of this indoctrination into European Christianity, uh, one thing that happens often is any occurrence um, in the Bible, which refers to black skin color, is explained away as an emotion. And this is simply not the case every time. <coughs> Excuse me. But 
it is the case sometimes. Now, one passage that I know a lot of people like to point to is proof that we're black. And after doing the research, I will say this. Well, let me read it first and then we'll come back to it. Behold the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people because of them that dwell in a far country. Prophecy there. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? And harv the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. I am black. Astonishment hath taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? So the daughter of his people, uh, Jeremiah is an Israelite, and the daughter of his people would be the descendants of the Israelites. Um, so right there in verse eight, uh, chapter eight, verse 21, this is why Jeremiah eight twenty one. for those just listening. For the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. I am black. Astonishment had taken hold on me. So after digging into the Strongs and everything else, I personally concluded that that is a reference to black being used as an emotion because the same word can be used as the word mourn. Um, so in context, he says, I am hurt. He's not talking physically. He's talking about I'm emotionally hurt. I am black. I'm mourning. I'm a, astonishment has taken hold of me. Wonder, bewilderment, like I'm confused and surprised. If you read through this, he's talking about all the terrible things happening to Israel as the punishment of them going into slavery. And then the second one, um, I know this one gets used a lot too. And again, I came to the same conclusion based on my research. And as much as I would have liked to use it as proof, to me, it's simply not proof. It refers to emotion. Uh, this is Jeremiah 14, 1 and 2. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the dearth. Judah mourneth, and the gates thereof languish. They are black unto the ground, and the cry of Jerusalem has gone up. We can see a lot of emotion there. They mourn. They languish. They are black unto the ground, or mourning to the point of falling on the ground. And the cry of Jerusalem has gone up. So these two right here, I personally concluded objectively that these do not support the idea of a black Israel, but more emotional in context. But let's tackle the low hanging fruit because there is a lot of low hanging fruit when it comes to talking about race and skin tones in the Bible. There is a full chapter, Leviticus 13, for example, the entire chapter is about skin color, how to detect leprosy, whether or not it's clean or unclean. It talks about scabs. It talks about the hair. It talks about darkness of the skin, redness of the skin, whiteness of the skin. So when people say skin color is not mentioned in the Bible, that is 100 percent false. Leviticus 13, you can go read a full chapter on skin color. And then we get into the concepts of um, vitiligo, uh, leprosy and albinism, which we'll come back to. So let's first talk about declarative sentences. Now, me being a writer and somebody who likes to know stuff in general, but more specifically likes to know my craft since I've I've been a writer for a long time, since really high school, where I started just writing to write stories. So a declarative sentence, also known as a statement, makes a statement and ends with a period. This is important. It's named appropriately because it declares or states something. They don't ask questions. They make commands or make statements with emotion. So that's a declarative sentence. So. In scripture, we find places where several declarative sentences are made about skin color. They don't ask a question. They end in a period and they fit the definition of a declarative sentence. Job 3030 is one example. He says, my skin is black upon me and my bones are burned with heat, period. Now, I've heard this explained away as, well, he was just covering himself in ashes. So I went and found a picture. This is Ganesh Nagababa. He is an Indian from India. This is what an Indian man, he has darker skin, and I chose this on purpose, a darker skinned man covered in ashes looks like. So if Job was a white skinned man, as, as many people would like us to believe, when he covered himself in ashes, he would look whiter than 
Ganesh Nagababa. But because Ganesh is a darker skinned man and he covered himself in ashes, we can see that Job is not making a statement based on being in mourning and cover himself in ashes and sackcloth like some people like to explain away. He's making a declarative statement. My skin is black upon me and my bones are burned with heat, period. So we see that there and we can logically look at that and say he, he wasn't talking about he was covered in ashes because he was mourning because of his condition. It doesn't fit. So now let's talk about metaphor versus simile. And this is something that I always found interesting in rap. Um, a lot of rap fans think similes are metaphors. They will often confuse the two. And once I explain the difference, if you don't already know, then it will become apparent. You might be like, oh, okay, now I understand that this is a metaphor and not a simile. So a metaphor, a figure of speech in which a word or phrase is applied to an object or action to which it is not literally applicable. Tupac's me and my girlfriend. The girlfriend was not talking about a woman. That is a metaphor. That song is a metaphor. Now, a simile. A figure of speech involving the comparison of one thing with another of a different kind used to make a description more emphatic or vivid. So again, in rap, you will hear this. They'll say, I do X, Y, and Z like, or I am something, something, something like, or sometimes they'll just drop the like part, have a series of bars, and then they'll drop a word, elephant, medicine, stuff like that. So that is the difference between a simile and a metaphor. And this is important because scripture uses both metaphor would be an uh, example of metaphor in scripture would be um the dream nebuchadnezzar's dream of the statue gold silver um iron made of clay that statue that is a metaphor for the kingdoms that would come and arise even though it's a prophecy it's a dream it's also a dream in metaphor the statue represents the kingdoms. So it fits the definition of a figure of speech in which a word or phrase is applied to an object or action to which it is not literally applicable. Metaphor. Simile. There is a <clears throat> chapter in the Bible in which we get a de two declarative statements and two similes in reference to skin color. And again, this is the low hanging fruit. This is the easy stuff. If you, you find if you just read through the Bible, which is why I always tell people just read the words. So in the Song of Solomon or Song of Songs, however you um, call it. We have this is not Solomon talking. I know some people get this confused again. This is why it's important to read and understand the context. This is the Solomon's lover. She says, I am black. This is Song of Solomon's chapter one, verse five. I am black, but comely. O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon, period. That's a declarative statement. But within that declarative statement, we see black as the tents of Kedar. That's a simile. She's giving you an example of something in comparison as the curtains of Solomon. Again, a comparison. Now, in verse six, <clears throat> another declarative statement. Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard have I not kept. So again, that's a declarative statement. And she says, look not upon me because I am black. Now, she gives an explanation as to why she's black because the sun has looked upon me so we know that she's literally talking about being a black person now those of us with darker skin know that if you stay out in the sun too long you get darker like our skin color changes we all know that now people that aren't us may not know that but we know that so we can relate to what she's saying i'm black because i've been out in the sun too long so it makes sense biologically to us where it may not make sense to other people. But again, if we just read through the scriptures, we find this sort of thing. In the book of Lamentations, also written by the prophet Jeremiah, we find interesting references here. And I'm going to read um, starting at verse four through ten. Lamentations chapter five, verse four through ten, uh, because it makes several uh, references that we're going to come back to later. 
It says, we have drunken our water for money. Our wood is sold unto us. Our necks are under persecution. We labor and have no rest. We have given the hand to the Egyptians and to the Syrians to be satisfied with bread. The Egyptians and the Syri Assyrians. We're going to come back to both of those. Our fathers have sinned and are not, and we have borne their iniquities. Servants have ruled over us. There is none that doth deliver us out of their hand. Now, later on, we'll come back to not in this study, but actually, if you go to um, if you go to the study on Israel, uh, addressing the evidence, I believe, part two, the Shemites, I get into. Uh, I believe I touch on Deuteronomy 28. I believe it is actually, you know what? I'm sorry. Addressing the evidence part four. I touch on Deuteronomy 28 and them not being redeemed out of the hand of people uh, out of the hand of the um, the captors, the enslavers. But let me keep going. I don't want to get sidetracked. I'm trying to get sidetracked. All right. We get our bread with the peril of our lives because of the sword of the wilderness. Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. So I got a picture of a, an oven. Now, I didn't just go get a regular oven. I got a stone oven, the type of oven they would have cooked in back in this time period. And here we see this stone oven, which is very dark. Now, it's funny because now that I'm moving the mouse, I, I recall that as I watched the, the premiere yesterday, I noticed that the mouse was on the screen. The, the mouse right there, you guys probably saw that. But on PowerPoint, I don't actually see the mouse. And so... There'll be times where I just start moving the mouse because I'm trying to get it to visual on my screen. And I noticed that during the premiere, I was doing that. So it looks like I'm always moving the mouse. So for those of you watching it, it looks like I'm just moving the mouse a lot. Sometimes when I'm about to use the mouse to point to something on the screen, I have to move it for a second to get PowerPoint to show it to me on my end, even though it's recording and you guys see it on the playback. So this right here is the oven. Our skin, it says our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine, period, declarative statement. So now more low hanging fruit <clears throat> where the Israelites get mistaken for Hamites. And some of you may be familiar with this part of the study from the other studies I've done. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites saw the mourning in the floor of a tad, they said, this is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians. Wherefore, the name of it is called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond Jordan. Genesis 50 verses 11. So this is where Joseph gathers everybody and they go to mourn the death of Jacob. And the Canaanites mistake these people for Egyptians. So that's the first occurrence. The second one. And they said an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. This is where Moses had slain the Egyptian police officer, buried him in the sand, found out somebody saw it and ran and became a fugitive. When he saved the Midianite girls, they mistook him for an Egyptian. And finally, in the time of Paul, art not thou that Egyptian, which before these days made us an uproar and led us out into the wilderness, 4,000 men that were murderers. Now, if you read through the whole story of Paul, when this happens, they don't believe he can speak Greek. They don't believe he's a Roman citizen and they mistake him for an Egyptian. This is all based on his skin color assumptions based solely on his skin color. Because if he looked European, they wouldn't have assumed that he couldn't speak Greek and that he wasn't a Roman citizen. They would have checked. They would have been like, I'm not sure. Let me check before I get in trouble. But because he looked like an Egyptian, they were surprised. Dost thou speak Greek? You'll see that. Go through, read the book for yourself. <clears throat> and here we see how depiction uh, Egyptians depicted themselves. This is um, from the tomb of Watai. 4400 years old uh the reference to this one i believe is in addressing the evidence part four there is a link in the description and you can click it and go see all this background information on this tomb now here we see egyptian mummies we see locks we see braids we see braids these might be locks i don't know but here we see that these are not Europeans. These are clearly black people. These are the Egyptians. So when Paul is mistaken for an Egyptian, 
over a couple thousand years after Moses was mistaken for an Egyptian, you can see that there is consistency that these people looked similar to the Egyptians. So now let's talk about some of the nuances and references, um, some of the stuff that should be obvious, but is not obvious. Um, for example, myself, I'll use myself for an example. I missed a lot of this when I was still under Eurocentric Christianity, not because I didn't want to believe it. I just never studied it because it never occurred to me to study race in the Bible, because as I mentioned before, in Eurocentric Christianity, you're pumped with this idea that the race doesn't matter. Now, when I say under Eurocentric Christianity, I was at a black church, but the pastor had gone to a white seminary and learned Eurocentric Christian doctrine, which is what he taught in the black church. So even though I was sitting in a black church, I was still under Eurocentric Christian doctrine. So I had never thought to look into these things. So right here, we have a picture of a leopard. And Jeremiah 13, 23 says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. So this is a, this is a question and then a statement. Um, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? And clearly the answer is no. The leopard cannot willingly change their spots and the Ethiopian cannot change their skin color this was something that was attributed to god now the reason this is important is because it gives us a little bit of context as to why moses gets a skin color change as a sign not just to pharaoh but to the israelites this is first assigned to the israelites so they'll believe god sent them and then he uses it as a sign to pharaoh later on but in Exodus 4, 6 through 7, it says, And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. That's a color description. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. So now if they're using the reference that he put his hand in, and he pulled it out. It's leprous as snow. Snow is white, technically gray, but you get the idea. So if he pulls it out and it's white, that means it was not white before. And it says when he put it back in, it was turned again as his other flesh. That means it turned back a different color from white. Moses is in Africa. Moses got mistaken for an Egyptian. So all of this makes sense as a sign because a leopard can't change its spots and the Ethiopian can't change his skin color. So how then is this miracle happening where Moses skin color is changing? That's why it's a sign. If Moses was already white or European or a tanned Caucasian, as some of these people would like to believe was happening in Egypt, this would not have been that big of a sign for a tan white person to not be tan. So this is a significant sign, as you see from the picture. It's a huge difference when you're a black person and your hands turn white. That is a huge difference. That's not something you would see every day in Africa. We have the same similar sign. Miriam. Miriam gets cursed. Uh, Miriam and Aaron have a problem with Moses' wife in Numbers 12.1. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married for he had married an Ethiopian woman in the um in the strongs it says Cushite he married a Cushite woman she was from the line of Ham she was a descendant of Cush who was also the father of Nimrod I uh, remember if you go to um through the addressing the evidence series you will see that Nimrod was a Cushite and Babel was a Cushite or African empire and Abraham is going to get called out of Babel, but Asher also comes out of Babel, which we'll see too. We'll come back to Asher in a minute. Now, when Miriam and Aaron angered God, he had them step outside. And this is the results. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam and behold, she was leprous. And I skip a few verses there because Aaron and Moses start to pray and say that Miriam looks like a dead woman. A stillborn child to be specifically. And the Lord said unto Moses, if her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days. And after that, let her be received in again. Numbers 12, 10 and 14. So 
he compares turning her skin white the equivalent of her father spitting in her face excuse me for a second i had to take a sip <clears throat> a sip of water throat getting dry <clears throat> so he equi- he makes this the equivalent to spitting in her face and again go watch uh some of my previous videos on addressing the evidence it doesn't mean that all white skin is a curse it just means that white skin was used as a curse for miriam in this situation in africa why is that though understand the context it has nothing to do with god saying i hate white skin understand that white skin is not conducive to the african sun melanin protects black people from the harmful effects the burning and all that that comes with the african sun so by taking away miriam's melanin he makes her more vulnerable more uncomfortable he puts her in a position of weakness now that's why it's considered a curse in africa to have white skin not just a curse in general to have white skin in africa it it works backwards if the lighter your skin the more uncomfortable and unbearable it is to be in africa that's why we see in israel today those claiming to be israelites the europeans the jews they have the second highest rate of melanoma or skin cancer in the world they are dying from simply living there because that region was not built for people of their skin color it was created for a dark skinned people so now hopefully you understand why miriam is cursed to have white skin in contrast to the ethiopian woman she was mad at who likely had very dark skin so let's talk about jihazi similar situation now Jehazi was a helper to Elisha and Naaman had come Naaman was born a leper now I'm not going to get into the whole um, Naaman's story but he was born a leper he didn't want to be leprous anymore um, because he was born a leper he had white skin from head to toe in Africa now remember the geography of the Bible. Israel is in Africa. Egypt is in Africa. Uh, Cyrene, Libya is in Africa. Cush is in Africa. Ethiopia is in Africa. Like all this stuff is in Africa. Um, so Jihazi wants a reward after Naaman gets his regular skin color back. And this is why, again, I mentioned albinism earlier. Because Naaman was born a leper and he was white from head to toe in Africa, and he wanted his skin color to be something else, his original skin color. Um, it's possible that he had, well, it said he was born a leper. He was born that way. So it's possible that he had extreme vitiligo or albinism, very likely albinism. So let's read the verse. This is from 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 25 through 27. But he went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Jehazi? And he said, thy servant went no whither. And he said unto him, went not mine heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants? Hold on, let me take a sip of water. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me, there we go. The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. So we see that Naaman was white as snow. So Elisha took what was Naaman's ailment and moved it on to Jehazi. Naaman did not want to be white in Africa or have white skin in Africa because, as I mentioned, that's not conducive to the region. So Elisha cursed uh, Jehazi and all his descendants to be leprous or white as snow forever because this is an uncomfortable condition to be in in Africa. And what would happen is they would more than likely start to move north towards Europe where they could be more comfortable in a colder climate where the sun isn't so harsh. Again, I'm not saying that's the origin of Europeans. I'm just pointing out what the logical step would be if you were turned white in Africa. So now let's talk about ethnonyms in the Bible. Now, basically an ethnonym 
is a word that describes race or ethnicity. One of these is Kush. I mentioned this on one of the other studies. Um, if you go through the addressing the evidence, the word Kush or Cushy Hebrew also appears several times in the Hebrew Bible to refer to a dark skinned person of African descent equivalent to Greek Ethiops. This has later been changed to Ethiopia, Ethiopian in later versions of the Bible, such as the King James Bible, King James Bible. So this is the definition of an ethnonym. Kush or cushy refers to a dark skinned person of African descent. Now we know that's not always going to be true. Um, this is a European definition, but they don't differentiate between, they assume all black people are African because of the, the teaching that ham is black. Um, Shem was middle Eastern and Japheth was white, but we'll, we'll see that's false as well. If you watch the addressing the evidence series, you've already seen that that's false. But for those who have not throughout this study, we'll see that that is false. So who were the Kushites? Kushites were people from the land of Cush. Cush, the place was named after Cush, the man, the oldest son of Ham. Ham was one of the three sons of Noah to survive the global flood. Cush was the father of Nimrod, the hunter. Much later, Moses married a descendant of Cush. So that's a quick uh, wrap from got a wrap up from gotquestions.org. So now if we jump down to here at the bottom of this, the word Cush itself means black. And historically, the people of Cush have been dark skinned. The prophet Jeremiah alludes to the Kushite skin color when he rhetorically states, can a Kushite change his skin? Or what I just read, can an Ethiopian change his skin and a leopard change his spots? It says the Ethiopian people have a tradition that after the flood, Ham traveled up the Nile River to the Atbara Plain. From there, they could see the Ethiopian tableland. Ham's family settled there and also in the nearby lowland. This tradition, supported by the biblical, biblical account, makes the Kushites among the most ancient people groups in existence. Doesn't that go back to what I just said about Nimrod being a Kushite and building Babylon? Babel, according to the Bible, was the first world empire and they had a single world language. <clears throat> so, and it says it's supported by the biblical account and makes Kushites among the most ancient people groups in existence. This is important because people claim that black people couldn't build civilization. And the Bible says that a Kushite built the first major civilization, the first technologically advanced civilization to the point it said they could do anything that they imagined. <clears throat> so understand that when people try to downplay black history there's a rich history of black people taking civilization to crazy heights you have nimrod the kushite in the bible even though he's a hamite and not an israelite he took them to a place that the the most high said behold the people is one and they can do anything that their heart imagines and then we see the moors who went into Europe and civilized Europe. We seen how the explorers came into Africa and saw all of the monuments because the Israelites and the Africans had been intermingling and mixing. We see in modern history, we know that a black man invented the uh, process to synthesize uh, medicines from plants. He invented the basically the whole pharmaceutical industry. We know a black man invented the gas mask, open heart surgery, the traffic light, mobile refrigeration, which is the reason we can have grocery stores in every city and 7-Elevens and all a lot of this other stuff. We built this nation. The reason they came to get us is because why? We built treasure cities for Pharaoh. Our ancestors built treasure cities for Pharaoh. So in the new world, which has the Egyptian pyramid on the black of the back of the dollar with the headstone slightly lifted up, I'm going to do a study on this, but the headstone is slightly lifted up in my opinion because they wanted to set themselves just a tad bit higher than Egypt as the Novos Order Seclarum or the second Egyptian order. That's not an exact translation, but the, again, we'll do a study on it. They wanted to differentiate themselves. And so what they did was they went and got Israelites just like Pharaoh did. And they had us come here and build them treasure cities. George Washington Carver invented what, like 200 uses for the peanut like this. They, they used our labor and our knowledge to make America one of the richest countries on the planet economically 
not resource wise. Africa's the richest country resource wise, but America economically is one of the richest countries on the planet because they had Israelite labor to build it and they had Israelite intelligence to invent stuff that they got the patents for. KFC, Popeye's chicken, that's us. Jack Daniels, that's us. Slavery, our knowledge was stolen and they patented it and now they have generational wealth based off of it. But anyway, I'm gonna continue so I don't get sidetracked into that. So let's talk about these ethnonyms that appear in the Bible. We have the word Cush, of course, um, Cush meaning black. But in Psalm 7, 1, David uh, was Sh Shigeon of David, which he sang unto the Lord concerning the words of Cush the Benjamite. So if words have meaning and names have meaning in Hebrew, which they do, and Cush means black, this his name was Cush probably because as a descriptor, not as a descendant from Ham, because it says he's a Benjamite. So he probably had black skin because it's an ethnonym. In Isaiah 11, 11, we see the word Cush used again, but this time in reference to the country. Um, but if we hop over to 2 Samuel over here, 1832, and the king said unto Cushy. Cushy is again. What did it say? Cush or Cushy. Refers to a dark-skinned person of African descent. So we're seeing this over and over again. We see this in Jeremiah. We see it in Zephaniah. We see the name Cushy over and over again. We see the name Cush. So we see the ethnonym that refers to different people with dark skin. Um, what I did not include in here is, as it mentioned, Cush has been changed to Ethiopia or Ethiopian in several parts of the Bible. So when you run across the words Ethiopia or Ethiopian, Understand that that is a reference to a Kush or Kushite. Reference to Kush or a Kushite. There we go. So, let's talk about names since we kind of mentioned the name Kush. Talk about what's in a name. Each name in scripture has meaning. And people were named so based on prophecies, their appearance, what they believe the personality of the baby was. All of these names have meaning. Let's talk about Asher. He's the Shemite. Now, I told you we're going to come back to the Assyrians and the Egyptians and everybody. So Asher is a Semite or a Shemite, where you get the term anti-Semitic or Semitic from. Asher comes out of the kingdom of Babel, which was under Nimrod, who was a Cushite. And it says, and Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Asher and built Nineveh and the city of Rahaboth and Kala. Genesis 10, 8 through 11. I probably butchered all of those words. But understand that Asher is an Israel, not an Israelite, a Shemite. He's going to come out of the land of Nimrod, which is Shinar. Um, just like Abraham is going to come out of Ur. So Abraham is under the Cushite Empire when he's called. Asher is under the Cushite Empire when he leaves and establishes Nineveh. We're going to come back to Nineveh. All of this is important, so I'm kind of stressing it right now that we understand the difference here. Asher is not a Hamite. Asher is a Shemite living in a Cushite or Hamite empire. Now we look up the name Asher, Strong's 806. We see here that it says black, an Israelite. And again, um, he wasn't an Israelite. He, he was a Shemite. Um, he wasn't from Jacob. He was from Shem. So here, black. Again, probably because Asher was black. So we're going to come back to that in a second because as I always say, when your doctrine is based in truth, it becomes consistent. And when it becomes necessary to change your doctrine based on evidence, you should because it helps keep you consistent. So we see the Asher, his name means black. And here we go. In Nineveh, I believe this is around 520-ish BC or so. Um, you guys will have to fact check that. I left the links in the um, study on Shem. These are the Assyrians. They descend from Asher. They look like they have thick lips. They look like they have thick, kinky hair, Negroid features. Important. This is important because we're going to tie all this together. 
Sir Harry Johnston. I like using this. I like using Sir Harry Johnston's um, book because one, it drives the urban apologetics community crazy because they cannot disprove it and it bothers them. So they've been trying to attack his character, his personal beliefs, because he's a Darwinist, a social Darwinist and most definitely a racist. But it doesn't change the facts. It doesn't change what he wrote in his book. It doesn't change that he won a reward from the Royal Geographical uh, Award from the Royal Geographical Society in 1904. It doesn't change that he is considered um, one of the world's leading contributors on African knowledge. It doesn't change any of that, whether or not he was a racist. The fact that he was a racist makes me believe it even more because he could appoint it and say, you know what? These Jews are white people and I don't want people to know the Jews are black, but he didn't. He called the Jews Negroes and we're about to see that right now. This is his book, The Negro in the New World, which is on the Smithsonian Institute website. He wrote that he published this in 1910. And the close up here, this is this is the nail in the coffin for the UA community. They haven't responded to it. If you want to go watch, um, go watch the Urban Apologetics Challenge video, Urban Apologetics Challenge. Go watch that video. I break down this evidence and then I follow it up. The Elamites and Sir Harry Johnston. I follow it up with that video. They can't respond to the evidence. So what they're doing is they're trying to attack his belief in Darwinism and social Darwinism and the fact that he's a racist to try to say, well, since he's a racist, we can't accept his visual observation that Israelites are black. So let me read what he wrote. The Elamites of Mesopotamia appear to have been a Negroid people with kinky hair and to have transmitted this racial type to the Jews and Syrians. There is a curliness of the hair together with a Negro eye and full lips in the prostrate of Assyria, which conveys the idea of an evident Negro element in Babylonia, quite probably the very ancient Negro invasion of Mediterranean Europe, of which the skeletons of the Alps Maritimes are vestiges came from Syria and Asia Minor on its way to Central and Western Europe. So he says the Elamites are Negroid people appear to be in the Negroid people and they appear to have passed this on to the Jews and Syrians or Assyrians. The Assyrians became the Syrians. That's why it says the Negro eye full lips in the portraiture of Assyria. What are these Assyrian Negro eyes, full lips. These are Syrians. So there's visual evidence of what Sir Harry Johnston was talking about, regardless if he was a racist or an evolutionist, there's visual evidence. He said they appear to pass this on to the Jews. So now here's Elam, Susa, Shushan Palace, where these images are discovered. Here are the Elamites. He said they appear to be a Negroid people, kinky hair, thick lips. Um, this isn't as big as the other one. Kinky hair, thick lips appear to have been a Negroid people. Right here today, Susa is considered one of the most important archaeological sites in the world and potentially among the largest, since although it has been excavated and researched for over 150 years, a significant portion of the ancient site remains buried. It calls Susa one of the most significant archaeological sites in the world. So here's where Elam, the Elamites were. Harry Johnson said they appear to be a Negroid people. Here's Susa. He said there's evidence of Negroes in Babylon and Sumer. Here's this. He said they appeared to have passed it on to the Assyrians. Here's this. The Assyrians were of Asher. Asher built Nineveh. So now, before we move on, and I connect all that, excavations of Susa started in 1836. It was identified as Susa in 1851. And in 1855, 1885, the French took over the site. So now, here's the timeline. So 1885, the French took over the site. In 1910, Sir Harry Johnston publishes his book based on visual observation of these Elamites, of these Assyrians. We're going to bring this all together in a second. So Harry Johnston publishes that. Now understand the reason that there was no incentive to hide these Jews as white people or claim that they were white was because the narrative had not been built yet. Understand that the um, the Jewish Federation was not established until 1899, 11 years before this book was published. The Jewish Federation didn't get commitment from Balfour in the Balfour Declaration until 1917, seven years after this book was written. And they said that they were going to give pal or, um, 
Israel land in Palestinian settlements. Now, Israel didn't get that land until 1948, 38 years after this book was written. The conspiracy to pass off Europeans as Israelites hadn't come into full effect yet. So understand that Harry Johnston was under no pressure to keep it a secret that Israel was black or that Elam was black or that Babylon was black or that Sumer was black or that Assyria was black. So you have Harry Johnston. Again, doesn't matter to these racists. That's a straw man argument that the urban apologetics community and many Eurocentric Christians will try to throw into this argument because they don't want you looking at this evidence. He said the Elamites appear to have been a Negroid people. People, Kinky hair, thick lips, black skin. These are painted on the walls at Susa, one of the most important archaeological excavations sites in the world. He said they appear to have passed that on to the Assyrians and to the Jews. These are the Assyrians. Thick lips, kinky hair. These are Judeans. If you go back and watch the addressing the evidence, I broke down this, this whole thing. These are the Assyrians here. These are Judeans. Kinky hair, thick lips. The Elamites passed it on to the Assyrians and the Jews or Judeans. Why? Because they are all from the line of Shem. Elam was the son of Shem. The Assyrians are Shemites. The Asher came out of Babel and went and built Nineveh and all this stuff. This was discovered at Susa and these are discovered at Nineveh. Again, when your doctrine is based in truth, everything becomes consistent and lines up. And it doesn't matter that Harry Johnston was a racist. He still spoke truth in his book. Again, he was a racist that lived in Africa. For those who have not seen the videos, he lived a lot of his life in Africa. He spoke multiple African languages and he did not like black people. So trust me, I fully believe he can identify a Negro when he sees a Negro. And when he looked at these, he's like, oh, these are Negroes. All these people are Negroes, which is basically the summary of his book. All these people are Negroes, the Assyrians, the Elamites, the Jews, the Asians. He, um, if you go down to the bottom of that page, when you look at some of the other uh, studies I've done, I point out that he talks about the Asiatic Negro. He was obsessed with Negroes and he was racist. He was obsessed with human zoos, as they point out in their video um, over in the Urban Apologetics channel. So let's talk about Kedar. And these are the names of the son of sons of Ishmael by their names, according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael, Nebajoth and Kedar. I'm going to stop right there. There's no need for me to but butcher all of the rest of these names. Kedar is the one I want to focus on. You can read that for yourself. Genesis 25, 13 through 16. If you want to read that list of names. But Kedar stands out because Kedar is the son of Ishmael. Ishmael is the son of Abraham and Hagar. Hagar is an Egyptian, a black woman, a Hamite. So Abraham had a son with a black woman and named he uh, one. And then, um, yeah, he had a son with a name with, with a black woman. A son, with a, name of, a son with a black woman named Ishmael. There we go. And Ishmael had a son named Kedar. So Kedar is Abraham's grandson. I'm not sure why it took me so much effort to get those words out. So Kedar here, strong 6938, means what says perhaps swarthy, a son of Ishmael, also his descendant. Perhaps swarthy. So what does that mean? Let's keep reading. We have the Brown Driver Briggs. Brown Driver Briggs, swarthy, black tinted. Interesting. Come down to Strong's exhaustive. From Kadar, dusky of the sit of the skin or tent. Kedar, son of Ishmael, also Bedouin, his ancestor as his descendants or representatives. Kedar. So dusky, dark, swarthy. And we see here the swarthy definition. Dark skinned dusky darkish in color used used in euphemistic or poetic reference to black or other dark skinned people so abraham's son is named kedar and this is what kedar's name means so let's go to ham ham is interesting because you see here in the um now i didn't pull up any verses i, I hope we're all familiar with the story of noah ham is mentioned in the story of noah if you're not familiar you can go read about ham in genesis chapter 10 and genesis chapter 9 so 25, 26 in the Strong's says a son of Noah, also his descendant, also a name for Egyptians. Interesting. We'll come back to that. Now, etymology, this is from Wikipedia. If you pull Ham up in uh, Wikipedia, 
Since the 17th century, this is like the 1600s. For those that understand how the centuries work, 1600s is the 17th century. Right now in the 2000s, we're in the 21st century. So since the 17th century or the 1600s, a number of suggestions have been made that relate to the name Ham, to a Hebrew word for burnt, black, or hot, to the Egyptian word for Ham, for servant, or the word for, I'm going to say HM, for majesty, or the Egyptian word Kemet, KMT, for Egypt. So now, this is the important part right here. Burnt, black, hot. If Ham is also a name for the Egyptians, that would mean the Egyptians mean ham, or I mean mean burnt, or black, or hot. Again, just loose translation. We're going to go deeper into this because there's a lot of jewels right here just looking at these two things. So, Kemet is mentioned, right? Kemet right here. KMT for Egypt is a name for the Egyptians. So, I said, okay, let me click Kemet and follow this rabbit hole, see where it goes. So here on ancient.eu, Egypt, it says to the ancient Egyptians themselves, their country was simply known as Kemet, which means black land. So named for the rich, dark soil along the Nile River where the first settlements began. This is how they try to explain away anything black. They try to say that they call themselves the black land because of the soil. Even though we saw that Kedar, who's the son of Ishmael, who was the son of an Egyptian woman, his name means black or swarthy. We see that the Egyptians depicted themselves as black people. We see the mummies are black people. And yet the explanation we are given from Eurocentric Christianity and even um, the scientific community that doesn't want to admit uh, what's really right in front of our face is that the Egyptians are black and it's called a black land because these are black people and not because there's black soil. Now, here, we have another reference. It says, descended from his family was another name inducing man, Egyptus, who subjugated the country of the Melanpodes and named it Egypt. Whether or not the original text of the library stated he named it after himself up in let me see. Oh, uh, yeah, they missed a word. Whether or not. Let me read that. Whether or not the original text of the library stated he named it after himself is up for debate. In Greek, melanpodes means black feet, perhaps because they walked in the rich, dark soil of their land, which is the annual Nile inundation flood brought up from the river floor. But the Greeks were far from the first people to notice the black soil of the land of the Nile. And again, a reference to being black, black feet. Call it black land, black feet, black people. Like these are the reasons we're being given as to why they refer to, to themselves as the black land, or some people will say land of the blacks. Even though they depicted themselves like this, these were not white people. These are not tan Caucasians. But in Psalms, we see the land of Ham is mentioned. Israel also came into Egypt and Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. These are Hamites. They showed his signs among them and wonders in the land of Ham. This is a reference to Moses doing his um, signs that God gave him. Wondrous works in the land of Ham and terrible things by the Red Sea. So we see that Egypt is called the land of Ham. Now, if we listen to Eurocentric Christianity and we're being honest, who does Eurocentric Christianity say comes from Ham? Black people. See, they've backed themselves into this corner by teaching this Hamite doctrine, I guess you would call it, that black people come from Ham. Because once you say black people come from Ham, you can no longer tell me that Egypt, Egypt wasn't a black nation and that the Egyptians were not black people, which is what they try to do now. They try to say, well, the Egyptians weren't black. Well, you told me they come from Ham and you told me Cush is black and Cush and Mizraim are brothers. You tell me the Ethiopians are black and they come from Ham too. The Libyans, they'll say, hey, well, the Libyans are not necessarily black. They're blackish. But no, the Libyans come from Ham. The Canaanites, they will tell you the Canaanites weren't black, but the Canaanites come from Ham. See, they want to have it both ways. They want to tell you on one hand that 
Ham is the father of all black people until it starts to to creep over into the Israelite section and you start to realize, wait, Israelites are black because they kept mixing with Kushites and Egyptians and other black people. We're going to continue. So this is a map. Uh, let me point this out first. Of course, you know, it's a map, but <laughs> Northern Africa. So when we mentioned Northern Africa, just notice this area in the red. Western Africa is going to be this area here where the, the transatlantic slave trade was occurring down here on the coast where they had the um, coast marked off as the slave coast, gold coast, etc. Uh, this is Central Africa right here, Eastern Africa in the green and Southern Africa in the purple. So when people reference those sections, you'll kind of get an understanding. So Egypt is over here and then you have Ethiopia, which is over here. Now, Ethiopia, here's another name that has meaning. Ethiopia from the Greek Athian to burn and ops the face hence the country of the blacks so you hear you have the land of the blacks here you have the country of the blacks populated by Hamites people who were we're told are black people the Hamites are black people according to Eurocentric Christianity and yet we're told that the Egyptians call themselves the black land because of the soil now let me see here down here, Merriam-Webster defines Ethiopian, a native or inhabitant of Ethiopia, a member of any of the mythical or actual peoples usually described by the ancient Greeks as dark skinned and living far to the south, archaic, a black person. That's what the name Ethiopian means. So they tell you that these are black people. They just they didn't even weren't even created. It's like, hey, this is the land of black people. This over here is the land of black people. All this stuff over here is just black people. The Kushites, black. Kush is Sudan and all that over in this area. Black, as we mentioned. They didn't even put any effort into naming us. Right here. Country of the blacks, land of the blacks, black. All of this stuff is black. Let's talk about Niger. New Testament. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas. Barnabas was black too. We could prove that. Uh, Barnabas um, was a Levite and he lived in Cyprus. And if you do the study on Cyprus, Cyprus was inhabited by black people. And um, the Levites, uh, if you go back, Moses was mistaken for an Egyptian. Moses was a Levite. So we know that he was similar in color to an Egyptian. He's a black person. Paul was mistaken as a Egyptian, but Paul was not a Levite. Paul was a Benjamite, but Paul lived during the time of Barnabas, of course. So we see that. And we also have the Limba who have been proven to be Israelites from the tribe of Le Levi. And the um, Limba are black. So everything is consistent from Moses to the Limba and Barnabas who falls in between. And Paul is just there for a su support reference that, yeah, Paul was also an Israelite. And he was mistaken as black. So anyway, and Simeon, that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with the Herod, the Tetrarch and Saul. So Niger, I just Googled Niger and this came up. Niger, Latin for black occurs in the Latinate scientific nomenclature and is the root word for some homophones of nigger sellers of Niger seed. Um, and then there's an example. So I did a um, study on this call from Niger to nigger, Simeon and the other black apostles. And I break down all the black apostles impossible. I'm sorry, the black apostles. <laughs> there we go. I break down all the black apostles and you can go on um, black history in the Bible .com. If you search for Niger, um, it should pull it up. If you prefer to read it on Kindle, uh, you can pull that up as well on Kindle. And I believe I have it in paperback if you prefer the paperback on Amazon. So you can grab that or read it for free on the Black History in the Bible website. But Niger, again, the names have meaning and Niger's name means black. So when you hear people use the N word, I won't keep saying it because a lot of people you know, think it's harsh to the ears. But when you use the N word, understand that this was our word that they started to use. They didn't take it. They started to use and mispronounce our word and use it to refer to us because as we've seen, they are not creative people. They just call us black. Country of the blacks, land of the blacks, Kush, black, Niger, black. They just called us black. 
So people look at it like, okay, well, this is a racist word and these people called us that. And we hear all this stuff. Uh, people say, well, the N word means ignorant. Well, maybe, maybe not. Based on what I'm seeing, it's just black. It's just literally another uncreative descriptor. It's just a general descriptor, black. So let's keep moving. Now we're going to get into a part on this study on race that's going to catch a lot of people off guard and by surprise if you have come out of camp doctrine you might be familiar with this if you are still following camp doctrine this might be a problem for you and again this is why i tell people stop defending doctrine search for the truth come to the truth run with the truth period so we're going to talk about ruddy skin tones now, ruddy skin is mentioned in the Bible several times, and we're going to do an objective study, a real study, not not none of this. Well, ruddy is this based on a definition. No, we're going to chase this down and really come to a legit answer. So ruddy versus red or red versus ruddy. Now, the first time the word red is mentioned in the Bible in connection with a person is Esau. So in Genesis 25, verses 20 through 23, I'll read those. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel the Syrian. Remember, Assyrians, Syrians come from the Assyrians and they were what? Negroid people. So Isaac took a Negroid, a wife with Negroid features. Uh, Bethuel the Syrian of Pat and Aram, the sister of Laban the Syrian. Now Laban's important because Rachel and um, Leah are the daughters of Laban and who's going to marry them? Jacob. And if they have Negroid features and Jacob is Israel and he starts his line off with Rachel and Leah, it means that his sons with Rachel and Leah are going to have Negroid features as well. So, and Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. So now Isaac is praying for this woman with Negroid features to have a child. And the Lord was entreated of him and Rebecca, his wife conceived. So the Lord allowed Isaac to have a child with this woman that has Negroid features and the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire the Lord. So now remember the Jews or the, the Israelites really have Negroid features and the Assyrians have Negroid features. So when you have two people with Negroid features coming together, they're still all Shemites. When you have two people with Negroid features coming together, what are you going to get? You're going to get a child with Negroid features or children with Negroid features. This is important in this study because this study is more logic because of some of the false information out there. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels and one shall be the stronger than the other people and the elder shall serve the younger now let me keep going um and when her days to be delivered were fulfilled behold there were twins in her womb and the first came out red all over like a hairy garment and they called his name esau and after that his brother came out and his hand took hold on esau's heel and his name was called jacob and isaac was three score years old when she bare them all right, so they make a big deal about Esau being red and hairy like a garment. Esau was red and hairy like a garment. Now, this is interesting because you have two people with Negroid features. They come together. They have two children. One stood out. One is red and hairy. The other is not. The other is smooth, and we'll see this. So we'll come back to that in a second. In 1 Samuel, ruddy. The first time ruddy is used in the Bible is to describe David. And this is where Samuel is going to find the king of Israel. And David is about to be appointed. Again, Jesse made, this is uh, 1 Samuel 16, 10. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, are here are all thy children. And he said, there remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance, and a goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. 
All right, so David is ruddy, and he's good to look upon. David is ruddy. Esau is red. So you will find teachers that will say, well, Esau is red and David is ruddy, and that's two different things. And they try to break it down and say red and ruddy are two different colors. Red refers to blushing. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, red, Esau being red is going to refer to him blushing and him having white skin and and blushing white skin and on the flip side which is interesting in eurocentric christianity they will say that ruddy is blushing and it means he has white skin so these definitions don't seem to fit neither of them because as we will see in genesis 25 25 we see that esau came out admonai ruddy this is strong's 132 now in 1 Samuel 16, we see that David gets brought and David is Admonai, ruddy, 132. They are the same word, ruddy and ruddy. The same exact word used in Genesis 25, 25 and 1 Samuel 16, 12. So don't let these people who tell you red and ruddy mean something different. Don't let them get away with that lie. That's false. They are not two different words. They they are translated differently, but it's the same exact word, Admonai, in Hebrew. So let's keep moving. So Esau. Now you've probably seen this picture before. People try to say this is Esau. So now if this is Esau, this is also David. Because as we've seen, they use the same exact word. So whatever definition you're going to give to Esau, if you're going to say Esau is the white man, you have to say David was a white man. You following the logic here? Because we know for a fact now that these are the same words in, in Hebrew. We can't now use the, the facade of, well, this is red and this is ruddy. No, they're both Admonai. So if you're going to say this is Esau, this is also David. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment. This guy is not red all over. He's not hairy. And they called his name Esau. So now, now that we understand that ruddy and red are both admonai in Hebrew, the same exact word, so we're going to apply it equally across the board, same exact definition. Let's talk about it. Lamentations. 4, 6 through 8. <coughs> Actually, we'll read the whole thing. 4, 6 through 9. Um, and this is a description, an interesting description that we get about their physical appearance for the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom that was overthrown as in a moment and no hand stayed on her. Her Nazarites were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. I'm going to stop right there. Now, Nazarites were a separate class that were supposed to be consecrated or set apart and supposed to be pure and holy. When it says they are whiter than milk, it's referring to their spiritual self not their physical self. One of the, well, I don't want to get off into that story because I'll get sidetracked. So anyway, the Nazarites were supposed to be set aside and they were supposed to be pure, which is why scripture then is very specific. It says they were more ruddy in body than rubies. More ruddy in body than ruby. So now they went, they shifted from them being purer than snow, whiter than milk spiritually to red or ruddy in body their polishing was of sapphire their visage is blacker than coal and they are not known in the streets their visage or their appearance is blacker than coal now understand the switch were is past tense this is this is where me being a writer comes into play why i look at words so carefully her nazarites were purer that's past tense were purer than snow they were whiter than milk they were more ruddy in body than rubies their polishing was past tense of sapphire and then it switches tense their visage is blacker than coal that's present tense they are not known in the streets that's present tense their skin cleaveth to their bone present tense uh present tense it is withered it is become like a stick they that be slain with the sword are better than they that be slain with hunger for these pine away stricken through one of the fruits of the land. So it switches from past tense to present tense. So their body is gone from a shift in color from more ruddy than rubies to the pop, uh, to blacker than coal. Now here, this picture is of unpolished natural rubies. 
So now, if they're more ruddy in body than rubies, they don't look like this. This is not Esau. Because ruddy and red are both Admonai. So Esau was very likely a, a redder shade of this. It says he, these people were more ruddy than rubies or more Admonai than rubies. So we have something to compare it to. A simile. Comparing it for effect. So in Lamentations, we broke that down uh, again. They were more ruddy. This is 119. This is going to be a different word because it's more ruddy or ready -er. So we're not going to get sidetracked into that whole study because that'll come back. You guys go check that out yourself. Verify for yourself. Lamentations 4.7. I told you I use BibleHub.com. Type in Lamentations 4.7. Click enter linear. And that way you can go read all this stuff for yourself. Now, what makes sense to you logically that they went from this to this? They say they were more ruddy in body and now their visage is black and the cold. Did they go from this to this? We know that white people sunburn when they're in the sun. We know that they don't turn black. Or does it make sense that they went from this to this? This is more likely to occur from here to here. The reason being. As we pointed out with the Song of Solomon, she said, I am black because the sun has looked down upon me. We talked about the fact that our people get darker when we're out in the sun. Europeans get redder. They get sunburned. They wouldn't go from ruddy in body like this to black as cold visage or appearance. It's just not a logical conclusion. So it's very likely that Esau was not the white man when he was born. Let me, I'm going to tell you 100%. Esau was not born the white man. He was not born a European, period. And we'll see this later because as we discussed with Ishmael, Ishmael was the son of an Egyptian woman who got pregnant by Abraham, who was a Shemite, who had Negroid features according to archaeology and everything else. And Esau actually marries the daughter of Ishmael. So if Ishmael is black, his children are black and Esau is born to a black man with a Assyrian wife who is also black and has Negroid features. And then Esau has a kid with a black woman. They are not going to come out Caucasian. It doesn't make any sense. So as as much as some of you would like to believe that Esau is all white men, I don't believe that to be so. I believe, again, the Europeans are the Gentiles. We're going to do a study on Esau. I do believe that Esau is present in some of what we believe to European be Europeans, like some of the darker ones, like those over in Israel. Some of the ones that can pass the DNA test. They have a little bit of the DNA. Why? Because Jacob and Esau are brothers. And we know that Esau mixed in with the Romans. Esau mixed in um, with the European nations in little bits. I'm trying to think of his name, Zepho. Um, we know that Esau mixed in. So we'll come back to we'll come back to that in the Esau study so we don't get sidetracked. But more ruddy than rubies. These are unpolished rubies, meaning their body was a similar color to this, and they became black as coal. So we have references to a skin color change. We have a actual physical object to compare ruddy to. But let's keep going. So when the doctrine is consistent, you know what ruddy means. Now you understand why David is depicted as this right here. You understand why when David is described as ruddy, people would paint him like this. Um, I think it was the 11th century. So again, consistency in truth. If you believe that ruddy looks like this, then you would be surprised to see King David look like this and all the people around him look like this. And these are Israelites. These are Israelites around him. They're all brown skinned people. They are not white people. You see, they have what? Bushy hair, bushy hair, bushy hair. So let's talk about the red heifer. Those of you who are intelligent thinking people, regardless of religion, mostly all agree that the red heifer looks like this. And again, we talked about the words red and ruddy mean the same exact thing. So if red and ruddy are the same exact word, Admonai, 
This is what the red heifer looks like, which means this is what Esau looked like. The words are there. He came out red, hairy all over. I'm not saying he looked like a cow, but you get what I'm saying. Esau was red and hairy. We do not think this cow is a white blushing cow. We know that they were not commanded to sacrifice a white blushing cow. So again, consistency. We'll start to see it becomes consistent when you use the word consistent. And in science, we see it here too, used in science and in, because of nature. This is an animal called the ruddy shell duck. Look at the color. This is a ruddy tree frog. Look at the color. So when people come telling you ruddy is white and Esau was born white because he was ruddy and David is white because he's ruddy and he was blushing. This is what a lot of the, the white supremacist doctrine teaches that David was a white boy who was blushing. That's why he's called ruddy. And yet when we look at the actual evidence, we see brown, 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 brown over and over and over again. We have the comparison to rubies, which are brownish when they before they're polished in their natural state. So they are browner than rubies more ruddy brownish now now that we got through ruddy let's talk about the bronze skinned humanoids that appear in scripture see i told you got told you this was going to be a in-depth study on race in the bible ethnicity skin color so there are brown skinned non-human humanoids mentioned in the bible and are bronze skin brown bronze same thing the living creatures in Ezekiel it says and I looked in a whirlwind came out of the north a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself and a brightness was about it and out of the midst thereof as the color of amber out of the midst of the fire go look up the color of amber also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures and this was their appearance they had the likeness of a man and everyone had four faces and everyone had four wings and their feet were straight feet and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass and they had the hands of a man of the wings on the four sides and they had four and they four had their faces and their wings so this is the actually the only picture i saw that actually showed a black man in place here uh, with the four faces now notice it says brass burnished brass we'll come back to that in a second here's a second appearance of a bronze colored man in the visions of god brought me into the land of israel and set this is ezekiel 40 verse 2 in the visions of god brought me brought he me into the land of israel and set me upon a very high mountain by which was which was as the frame of a city on the south and he brought me thither and behold there was a man whose appearance was like unto was like the appearance of brass with a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed and he stood in the gate so his appearance as brass we'll come back to this this word bronze because we're going to get into a word study in a second and this word brass is actually bronze or copper we're going to see this in a second it's actually bronze or copper it's not brass in the sense that we sit, uh, think about it. And for those that want proof, just continue watching. Because like I said, when the scripture and when the belief is consistent and based in truth, it will become consistent. When it's based in truth, it becomes consistent. So what does God look like? Let's talk about it. People say we don't know what God looks like. God doesn't have a color. Blah, 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 blah. So if the Bible is God's word, and I believe it is. That means that every word in the Bible is of God, which means that we are supposed to study every word of the Bible, like Acts 17, 11. It calls the Bereans noble because they would listen to Paul and they would go study his study, the word to see if what Paul was saying is true. We all know the verse study to show thyself approved. So what does God look like? Does the Bible tell us? Now, here we have in the book of Daniel what people believe to be many believe to be a pre incarnate Christ. And he gets gives us a description in those days. This is Daniel 10 to verse verses to Daniel chapter 10 verses two through seven. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine into my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hittichel, then I lifted up my eyes and looked and behold, a certain man clothed in linen whose loins were girded with the fine gold of Euphaz. 
His body was like the barrel and his face is the appearance of lightning and his eyes lamps of fire and his arms and his feet like the color of polished brass and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them. So they fled to hide themselves. So notice it says his body was like the barrel, B-E-R-Y-L. So I decided to look up barrel and it's interesting that these came up. Barrel varieties by this is uh, geology in dot com. I didn't know the emerald was considered a barrel or the aquamarine or any of this. But anyway, these are all considered barrels. So it would seem that he has a, a strangely colored body at first. But again, you have to do more digging than the surface. So Tarshish, this is the word for barrel. A precious stone. Perhaps yellow jasper. I said, that's interesting because I didn't see yellow jasper on this list. I saw emerald, heliodor, bixbite, aquamarine, maxikes, morganite, goshenite. I think that's trapeche emerald. I didn't see yellow jasper. So I said, okay, let me look up yellow jasper. And interestingly enough, this yellow jasper is brownish tint. This is polished. This is unpolished. It has a brownish yellowish tint to it. And I said, okay. That's interesting because in some of here, you can see pieces that look bronze or copper. Some of these have bronze or copperish coloring to them. Okay, cool. Let's keep moving. Hands and feet of bronze. So we talked about this. Hands and feet of bronze. These are molds or bronze molds or bronze castings of hands. This is the color of bronze. So if this guy he saw has the color of a barrel in color again copperish yellowish bronzish and we see bronze here <coughs> excuse me and let's keep going we should this should be consistent right so i decided to pull up the strongs and right here we see his his arms and feet like in color to bronze not brass bronze burnished bronze to be exact burnished bronze so 5178 real quick i just want to show you that before i move forward 5178 that's the strongs number 5178 copper bronze if you have a penny pull out a penny that's what copper looks like i just showed you what bronze looks like this is what bronze looks like so we see the description is consistent we see bronzes bronze tints in this yellow jasper bronze colored right here it says bronze copper i uh, believe brass is translated as brass twice but bronze 130 times <coughs> so let's come over here to burnished bronze 744 so burnish so i decided to look up the word burnish burnish means to polish something especially metal by rubbing polished by rubbing the shine on a highly polished surface. So he looks like polished bronze. So I decided to Google burnished bronze. And this is what came up. As you can see, this is brown. I just Googled this. This is what comes up when you just Google burnished bronze. Google it for yourself and see. So then from there, I was like, you know what? Let me click images. And we see all this brown stuff keeps coming up when you click burnished bronze. So this is the color of the hands and feet of the man that... Daniel saw who many believe many believe are is a vision of pre-incarnate Christ. We see right here skin color, burnished bronze. What do we see right here? A black woman. This is what we what we get when we start investigating. So now it says he has feet like fine bronze. This is a revelation. This is John. Years later, way after Daniel, it says, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks and in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one like unto the son of man or Christ clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Ain't that the same thing Daniel saw? His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as the snow and his eyes were as a flame of fire. We got similes white as snow. Hairs were white like wool. His eyes were as a flame of fire. These are similes. Right above it, you have the declared statement. And in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one alike to the son of man, clothed with a garment, down to the foot, and girded about the paps with a golden girdle. Period. End of sentence. It says, and his feet 
like simile unto fine brass as they burned in the furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters period declared a statement with a simile so we have brad a uh, bronze feet right here so again i decided let's since we're in the greek now let's look and see what happens so right over here we see bronze fine bronze which is different from brass we see right here here's 5474 i'm not going to try to butcher this word for you um even though it's a pronunciation right here i'm not going to do it so here's what's interesting though it says usage this um word right here a fine metal or frankincense of a yellow color so we have copper bronze or brass and it says of a yellow color but let's again use logic based on the consistency we've seen we know what bronze looks like we know that daniel used bronze or copper to describe him do we have people that are close to the color of a penny real people because remember christ walked the earth and we're seeing daniel gave a post um a post incarnate christ description and john gives a post resurrection description and they match they both reference copper and then we have brass so what's more likely that christ was this color or this color this is brass this is polished brass this is a copper penny what's more likely and we can use logic to determine that christ was very much a copper penny color and not a brass color the most high we get a description so anyway before we get to the description over there so right here burned blonde burned bronze um it says i burn am set on fire and flame to glow with heat so i decided to google glowing bronze and here's what we get when you type in glowing bronze you still get these shades of brown so now when i saw her here i was like yeah let me look this up and see <laughs> so if you go if you pull this and you get her to come up if you click her it will take you to a page and it's actually talking about the color of her hair and not her skin color so that explains why you have the hair here you have the hair here you have the hair here all of this comes up when you type glowing bronze because it's actually a hair color from what i understand from what i read real briefly these are hair colors glowing bronze and as you can see the color of the hair so this is the color that daniel and john saw when they looked at the messiah they saw his hands and his feet of copper or or bronze so when your doctrine is based in truth it becomes consistent and you're not surprised when you find a picture like this of christ being black or copper or bronze and his disciples being the same color niger cushy kush all of these names start to make sense and this painting by the way is found in the coptic museum in cairo egypt it is the oldest known depiction of christ but again consistency and that's that's what i keep saying consistency when your doctrine is based in truth it becomes consistent so when you see a black christ and you say okay well i've gone through the bible i've done a study on race and skin tones and everything that i've studied up to this point seems to indicate that israelites were black or some shade of black they were black they were ruddy they were copper they were bronze and if you look around and see black people we come in all those various shades it's not inconsistent to say that we're all those colors we even come in albino we come in every skin color imaginable and so you're not surprised when you see this then when you see something like this who is considered to be saint anna by the orthodox church saint anna is considered to be the mother of mary saint anna is depicted as a dark-skinned black woman her husband is depicted as um this is nathan uh hold on wait let me make sure i'm right no saint uh jo joachim this is saint joachim he's depicted as a black man with an afro afro light hair kinky hair married to a black woman so if they're black mary would be black feel free to google black virgins around the world and you will get tons of information about black virgin mary statues and depictions all over the world so again consistency so if anna's black and anna's husband is black and mary comes out black then it makes sense we would have a black christ 
It makes sense that he would de be described by Daniel as bronze in the New Testament. I'm sorry, in the Old Testament and by John as bronze in the New Testament. All of this makes sense when tied together. So let's talk about another description. We get more descriptions in Revelation chapter four, verses um, one through four. After this, I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard were was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show you the things show you. Hold on. And I will show the things which must be hereafter. My fault. I usually just replace the words in my head as I'm reading. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one set on the throne. And he that sat on sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight, like unto a rim, like unto an emerald. So we're going to stop right there. We got stones. We got jasper stone and sardine stone as the descriptors. We've already had bronze and copper. We've had black. Now we had possibly the yellow jasper as an earlier descriptor. So we see the Jasper stone is a brownish stone. We see the rainbow Jasper is a brownish stone. And we see the sardine stone, which is copperish in color. So it becomes consistent. Now, this is the visual of the most high. He's seeing. He's seeing the one on the throne. He's describing him in these colors. This is what he looks like. So if the most high, the father, is this color. Then it makes sense that the son would also be this color. And it makes sense that when he's born into a human body, he would choose people that are this color so that he would be born the same color that he is in the book of Daniel. All of this logically makes sense. But people, again, will tell you we should not focus on color because it causes a problem for them, not because it's wrong, because when we go into a history class and we learn about Attila the Hun, we know that he is Asian. They have no problem learning that Attila the Hun is Asian. They have no problem learning that Adolf Hitler was a, a Jewish Nazi mix that lived in Germany. They have no problem talking ethnicity when you talk about um, Africa. When you talk about Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King, they have no problem saying he's a black man. The only time that race becomes an issue when they start to say it's not of God is when we start to say, hey, let's put the Bible in context of race. Let's see who these people were. Then suddenly we're in the wrong and we're not Christian and we're not of Christ. All because we say, look, this is history. If this is history, these people had a color because everybody walking the earth had a color. They had an ethnicity. They had a culture. And these people came from somewhere and they went somewhere. And the problem is when we start looking, because once we start looking, we start uncovering the truth and we figure out who was who and what was what. And we figure out that everything is not what it appears to be. The head will become the tail and the tail will become the head. You can look around and see who's the head and who's the tail right now. So let's talk about everything in context. When we talk about truth or the color of the creator, we've gone through all well not all of them we've gone through a lot of references to skin color in the bible a lot of them enough to the point that i believe that it's sufficient evidence to prove anybody wrong that claims skin color is not in the bible and it's not of god because again it is definitely in the bible and if it's the word of god and the word of god proceeds from god then talking about these subjects is of god and anybody that does not believe that give me a list a specific list according to the Bible of every book, chapter and verse we are not allowed to research. Give me the list, the comprehensive list of every book, chapter and verse in the Bible we're not allowed to talk about. And if you cannot do that, then I'm allowed to talk about everything, including Job 30, 30, where it says my skin is black upon me or Song of Solomon verses uh, chapter one, verses five and six, where she says I am black. We are allowed to talk about those things if they proceed from the word of God. Unless you give me that list using the word of God to show me what I am, what I can and cannot talk about. So let's again, let's put all this stuff side by side. when We talk about the color of God because it's one thing seeing the picture separate, but it's another seeing them side by side. The yellow Jasper. We see it has copperish tones. We see the Jasper brownish in color. We see the rainbow Jasper. We see the sardine stone. All of these are similar in tone. And they're all brownish. They're all colored. None of them are white or Europeanish in tone. 
None of them are Arabish in tone. These are the tones of black people. And again, they were using stones to try to describe what they were seeing in the supernatural realm and trying to convey it into natural terms. So don't think that these are exact colors that they saw. These are representations of something supernatural that they were trying to put into natural terminology to give us the idea that, hey, I saw this brown dude sitting on the throne. I saw somebody that looked like us. I saw somebody that looked like our people. This is what they were trying to convey. So if you enjoyed the study, make sure you grab your copy of Undeniable Full Color Evidence of Black Israelites in the Bible. It shuts down all the UA arguments, the Eurocentric Christian arguments. It shuts down arguments from black people to say we aren't the people in the book. It shuts all that down with visual full color evidence. And then if you want the history to be able to back the evidence, you want the history from biblical times all the way till now grab the black hebrew awakening the final 400 years as slaves in america this book right here is guaranteed to give you a a much broader understanding of this subject it's not what the media makes it out to be it's not just one centralized belief um there's a lot more to the history and it's good to know your own history don't rely on people that aren't us to teach you the history about us so if you want to show your support, patreon.com forward slash Dante Fortson. Um, also, I have cash app, cash tag BHITB. I have PayPal. And for those of you that catch the super chats um, during the premiere, you can show your support in the super chat as well. And as always, make sure you subscribe to my channel. I got a ton more stuff coming for you. Subscribe to my channel. Click the like button. And most importantly, click the notification bell. So that way you don't miss anything. The notification bell is important. If you want to know as soon as I put out new content, click that bell, turn on all notifications for the channel. All right. With that said, hope you guys enjoyed this. Until um, next time, I'm out.